Chapter 17, Notes of Apology. Today we will focus on the little inconveniences, such as spills, and how to handle them in a fine dining situation. I straightened my shoulders into coat hanger order. I swore I was in that movie where you wake up and it's the same day over and over again. It was our second class of the third week, but who was counting? Since the 4th of July holiday fell on a Monday, we were having three classes this week to make up for missing next Monday. That meant this week it was the same day, over and over and over again, on Friday, too. Miss Melton Mowry didn't seem to mind at all. Let me demonstrate what I mean, she said, as we watched her haul misinformation out of her seat and drag her over to the space between me and Delton. There was some trouble with getting her to stand. Even after our teacher finished setting her up, Miss, I swayed a little, the same way my mom does after she's had a classic margarita at the tortilla factory. We always went to the tortilla factory on the summer solstice. Now it was the last week in June, the sweetest time in summer. The days went on forever. You could lie on your back and watch the fireflies and the bats come out at dusk. The dirt smelled like perfume and played kick the can. Excuse me. The dirt smelled like perfume and playing kick the can could last until your parents dragged you in to go to bed. Or you could learn how to get a waiter's attention. All right then, let's say you have spilled a bit of water. Simply drop your napkin over it like so and, when the wait staff appears, indicate in a low modulated voice that you would appreciate another napkin. Let's begin with you, Miss Corcoran. Miss Corcoran? I tried to pull myself out of my etiquette coma and focus on what Miss, Miss Melton Mowry was saying. Um, can you define modulated? Quiet and controlled, like so. Miss Melton Mowry dropped her napkin on the table and looked up at misinformation. She gestured at the napkin and pressed her lips together like the napkin was covering up something rotten. When you have a moment, could you bring me another napkin? She waited a few seconds. We all did, as if Miss Information would finally open her mouth and say something. Thank you, Miss Melton Mowry said at last. I would be most obliged. But what if you need your napkin before she gets back, I wanted to know. If she takes a powder in the kitchen? In polite society, Miss Corcoran, spills are rare. When we control our movements, we reduce the risk of an accident. The risk of having two accidents in a short space of time is very low. I hated to disagree, but Miss Melton Mowry had obviously never read The Nine Lives of Magda's Glasses. Putting a slip knot into the corner of my napkin, I stuck my butter knife in it. What are you doing now? You need to stop playing with your napkin and return it to your lap. It's not a napkin. It's a white flag. I waved it for demonstration purposes. I'm surrendering. Geez, Miss Melton Mowry, we're not robots, we're kids. And in case you haven't heard, with kids, accidents most definitely do happen. I glanced over at Officer Weston, who was clearly not a kid, and at Delton, who was sitting as stiff as, well, the zombie robot. Present company accepted. Miss Corcoran, kids are baby goats. And yes, children have accidents, but you are not a child any longer. You are a young lady who will replace her cutlery and return to the subject at hand. Yes, ma'am. I dropped my knife back on the table and unknotted my napkin, but not before gesturing in a 21-gun military sort of way. There is no need to salute. Now, Mr. Bean, Miss Melton Mowry turned to Delton. How would you get the waiter's attention? Remember, as we discussed last week, speaking in a loud voice is distracting. If the waiter is not nearby, you'll need to use, bo use your body language. Well, Delton sat up and cleared his throat like he was going to recite the Pledge of Allegiance. In your video on fine dining, I seem to recall that you can get the waiter's attention by looking at him and, he paused, searching his massive data bank for fine dining details, hmm, sometimes you can do it by directing your energy, but if that fails, you can, you could poke him, Officer Weston prompted, clock him in the shins, a favorite of mine. I remember Delton forgot himself and snapped his fingers. Arch your eyebrow. You can't be serious, Officer Weston said. How's he going to see that across a crowded restaurant? Let's practice, shall we? Now, Officer Weston, please direct the intensity of your gaze at misinformation and draw her to your assistance. Officer Weston screwed up his face like a rock had just landed on his foot. All right, and if that doesn't work, then you can raise your hand slightly. Try that, Miss Corcoran. I let my hands float up from the table like I did in yoga class, only they floated a little too far and knocked misinformation off balance. She fell forward like a chopped tree, smacking her head on the table where it stayed while the rest of her fell to the floor. 
Miss Corcoran, you do try my patience. The purpose of these lessons is to demonstrate the correct way to behave in a fine dining situation. Your aim is to be polite, gentle, seemly. You are not to draw attention to yourself. Does it exist in the realm of your imagination to conduct yourself in a manner appropriate to the young lady you seem to be, at least on the outside? Need I remind you that there is more at stake here than your entertainment? There were more words, but I was focused on using the intensity of my gaze to tell Miss Melton Mowry that her spit was landing on her tablecloth and my napkin wasn't big enough to cover the spray. Excuse me, Miss Melton Mowry, Officer Weston had returned Miss Information's body to a standing position. If you hand me the head, I think I might be able to fix it. This, Miss Melton Mowry picked up the head and thrust it at Officer Weston was made by the gentleman who repairs all the antique clocks for the royal family in Dubai. It is extremely unlikely that you can fix it, but by all means, officer, give it a try. Miss Melton Mowry was having what my dad calls a, Mich a Michelin three-star tirade, tugging first on her sleeves and then on the bottom of her blazer before closing her eyes and pressing her hands to her very red cheeks. Do you believe in miracles, Mr. Bean? I'm going to be an aeronautical engineer, Miss Melton Mowry. Miracles are not a mechanically valid. We'll start believing now, and that's an order. When her eyes finally opened, Miss Melton Mowry stared at us as if she wasn't sure why we were there. I need to excuse myself for a moment. Just practice polite conversation. Officer Weston blew into the hole in Miss Information's neck and tried again to insert the screw into it. You should go apologize, Cassidy. Me? What did I do? Officer Weston and Delton stayed silent, letting me figure it out for myself. I didn't, I didn't mean to make her so mad. I broke off, trying to think of something to say to defend myself, but I couldn't. I'd really done it this time. I beheaded her best doll. Twice. Bending Miss Information's body so that she sat in his lap, Officer Weston tried to screw her head back into place, but her hair kept getting caught in his shirt buttons. Delton helped out by pulling the hair into a ponytail and holding it above her head. You're so natural at being a pain, you can't even see it, Delton said, smoothing Miss I's hair back down and tucking it behind her ear. I think her collar's stuck in the next scene, he told Officer Weston. She's only trying to do her job and make us civilized, Cassidy, Officer Weston managed to unpinch Miss I's collar, but now her head tilted again. She looked at us with her head cocked like that, like she wished she could figure us out. Figure me out, I should say. We need an even bigger screw, Delton said. Maybe a plaster screw with an anchor bolt. We better leave her headless until we get one. I'm afraid if she loses her head again, there will be permanent damage. Officer Weston carried misinformation back to her chair and set her head in her lap. But why, I persisted, why do we have to be civilized? It's called growing up, Cassidy, Delton said, and it's going to happen whether you want it to or not. It already has happened to me. How'd you like to be doing this when you're 27, Cass, Officer Weston? Excuse me, it already has happened to me. How'd you like to be doing this when you're 27, Cass, Officer Weston asked me. That was definitely nightmare material. All right, all right, I'll go apologize. I pressed my ear to the door of Mills Melton Mowry's office and heard music again. It wasn't the same as before. I closed my eyes and tried to picture the river and the drops of water, but I couldn't do it. This wasn't river music. I knocked. I'd like a few moments to myself, please. I know, I said, opening the door anyway. But I was thinking, well, maybe if you put on the water music, you'd feel better. This sounds more like a bunch of birds in a tree screeching at one another. Miss Melton Mowry was looking at a photograph, but when I opened the door, she slipped it into the top drawer of her desk. Even I knew it was rude to ask her about the picture. My sister Fa Magda found a photograph of my great-grandma, I told her. She was hunting poachers in Africa. Miss Melton Mowry took a tissue from the box on her desk and pressed it to her cheek. Miss Corcoran, when someone tells you they need a private moment, you should respect their wishes. I know. I stood there wondering if apologizing trumped respecting Miss Melton's Mowry's wishes. I just wanted to say I'm sorry. 
I know I'm obnoxious. My great grandma used to say I got on her last nerve. You do have a knack. I, I am sorry, I said again, and was surprised to find that I really meant it. I pushed you to the brink. When I do that to my dad, he calls it the full moon of madness. Maybe you were right about the music. She pressed a button on her radio and found something better. Not the water music, but calmer. What makes me feel sorry is that I haven't been able to demonstrate the importance of these lessons. Excuse me, what makes me feel sorry is that I haven't been able to demonstrate the importance of these lessons. To you, they are just an endless series of pointless rules designed to keep you indoors and bored half to death. I nodded but stayed quiet, since the only honest thing to say was that I couldn't have agreed with her more. But they're not, really. Manners are useful. They are the means by which people can enter another world, you might say. They can bridge a gap that exists between their stations in life. Miss Melton Mowry broke off, possibly because she could see I didn't have the foggiest, as my dad would say, what she was talking about. Well, there's no point in repeating myself. We could chant Om, maybe. That's where you take a deep breath and moan. If you do it three times, you pretty much forget what you were sore about. Thank you, but I think I'd rather try to find some Debussy. I had almost closed the door when she said, and that was a nice apology, Miss Corcoran. It felt sincere. The best part of a bath is pretending your toes are shark teeth, bobbing just above the surface of the water, coming in closer and closer to your head until they devour you. Don't blame me, Magda sat on the edge of the tub while I mopped up the floor with an old bath towel. I didn't force you to play Jaws in a bathtub that was dangerously over full. It wouldn't be so disgusting if you'd actually cleaned under here when you drew our bathroom from the chore list. I had made it to beneath the sink where a bunch of Magda's hairs climbed up the porcelain. Next time, I'll make my toes an iceberg and recreate the story of my life as the Titanic crashes into it. For a girl who wishes she were a boy, you'd make a darn good drama queen. I didn't have a snappy comeback to that. I was beginning to understand what my dad meant when he said, whatever happened to my happy, carefree, hop-along Cassidy? I really was turning into a world-class whiner. Mom wanted me to give you this, Magda held out a razor. You want me to hurt myself? I'm not that depressed, Mags. No, she wanted me to inform you that shaving your armpits will help with your um, body issues. You mean my B.O.? Is everybody talking about it? Geez. For the first time in my life, I was happy to have a reason to keep my head down and scrub. It's creepy to think of people talking about what's happening under your arms. Well, it makes sense in theory. We have about three to four million sweat glands, and your forearm, for example, doesn't smell when you're sweating there. At least mine doesn't. Head down, I kept swabbing the deck, but I was listening. The smell people associate with sweat isn't actually sweat. It's what results when the bacteria that live on your skin down, excuse me, it's what results when the bacteria that live on our skin break down sweat into acids. Therefore, I wasn't able to definitively solve this with an internet search. It seems like common sense that the more sweat is trapped on the hairs that grow under your arm, the more bacterial action. Thus, the stronger the odor will be. I was about to protest that I didn't have any hair under my arms, but the truth was I did. Not a lot, but some. I bet Great Grandma Reed didn't shave under her arms while she was chasing poachers and whatnot. Probably not. As usual, Magda had that look she gets when she's contemplating chemical reactions. The distinctive smell we give off doesn't have to be perceived as bad. That's a cultural notion. Our body odor is a result of genetics, our diet, our lifestyle, the medications and supplements we take. Our ancestors loved the smell of their family members. And just think of the way dogs want to get into your Magda. It is possible that you are the most disgusting sister on the planet. Just give me that and make yourself disappear. Reaching out, I swiped the razor before putting my hand back down on a pile of 15-year-old sized toenail clippings. End of chapter 17.